Okay, welcome to Herb's Point YouTube channel and media channel where we try to present videos that are useful for our patients over at uh, Brazos Heart Rhythm and Brazos Weight and Wellness, but also hopefully uh, for the world over. And so today we're going to be talking about wound care after pacemakers and defibrillators. So that's the big topic for today. Um, good to see you again. As always, I'm CJ Wilson. Uh, many of you may know me and then others that don't. Uh, welcome to our channel. Today, we're primarily just focusing on one aspect of wound care, and this is the, the incision itself and, and how that heals up. So as we jump in through this, uh, I'm going to hopefully answer most of the common questions that people present to us. Uh, if there's other questions, we'd love for you to post them in the comments below, and we'll try to uh, get those questions answered as well. But uh, for today, we're going to get started. So again, wound cares, pacemakers, and defibrillators only. There's other things that we do implant, such as loop recorders. I'm not going to be referring to those, so it's just these two things. Uh, as always, I do want to add my disclaimer. If you're one of our patients at Brazos Heart Rhythm, yes, you can take this advice directly because this is what I would tell you in our visits. Uh, if you're not one of our patients, then I am not your medical provider. Uh, and so this is not specific medical advice for you. Um, read this very clearly and then also make sure you have good communication with your doctor or your provider because they may have some uh, pieces and parts of the advice I give that they don't agree with or that they would like to do differently. There's also different ways to implant the devices and so again this is general information for most folks and this is specific information for our patients. Uh, so with that being said like I mentioned out here you have been warned. So first off we have to kind of get a feel for what we're even talking about here as far as uh, what just happened, okay? And so I'm going to kind of cover these things fairly quickly because uh, that's not really the main uh, point of this video. The main point is to talk about the care of it. But, but anyway, just to make sure we understand what happened, there's going to be an incision. Typically, it's up here on the left side of your chest. I'm make myself a little bit bigger here. Uh, there's going to be an incision on the left side of your chest, and then there's going to be some wires that will run down into the heart, and I'll show you some images of that here in a second. There's going to be a bigger device, uh, something like this. This is a pacemaker from one of the companies. This is not a real pacemaker, but it's a model, pretty good replica of what it would look like. And it's going to be sitting usually kind of over here in your left chest, somewhere in this general area. And few people, we will put it over here on the right side. Um, but that's, again, pretty rare. Most people, it's going to be on your left side over here. So there's an incision, and then this thing is tucked down into the chest cavity. And then it's sutured up. And typically for us, we put sutures that dissolve. And so those sutures are internal. You can't see those. And then on the external, on the surface, we glue it shut. Uh, and we use um, a product. Honestly, it's super glue. We call it Dermabond, uh, and it glues shut the outer layer, and so that will be shiny. And again, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more. But that's the the basics of it. Is we we make a cut, we we make a cut, we insert some wires, we insert a battery, uh, we call it a generator, uh, and then we sew it up, and then we glue it up, and off we go. I did add this one little thing here at the bottom. In some select cases, we use a very special antibiotic envelope. Uh, that's not for everybody, but I have found that when we use the antibiotic envelope, it tends to be a little bit more uh, swollen for a time until that envelope dissolves away. So if, if that's you, then that's uh, slightly different than the standard, but we do use those occasionally. Okay, jumping forward. So what I just mentioned, I want to show it in a chest x-ray, and hopefully I do this right. So we're going to jump here. This right here is the, whoops, sorry. This right here is the generator, as we call it. Most of this is battery, and there's a little bit of a motherboard there. Uh, and then the wires go up, and there's a very small uh, vessel we use right up here called the subclavian vein, and we insert the wires into there. And then it's kind of just following the highway, follow the highway down to the IVC, and then down into the right atrium. That's where this one is right here, and then down into the right ventricle. This is a standard dual chamber pacemaker. There's different terminology, and again, we'll talk about that in different videos, but this pacemaker has two wires, one in the right atrium, one in the right ventricle. Just to show you what those wires look like, let me get this bigger here. Maybe kind of hard to see, but this is a, a wire, and this one's a little bit long, but it coils up, and again, it inserts directly into the pacemaker. We call this the header. It inserts in there, and then this whole thing is tucked down and dropped down into uh, what that chest x-ray was showing uh, into the right atrium. Again, you might have a second wire, so you could have two wires plugged in. You could even have three wires. 
Um, and so you could have multiple wires stuffed down into the pocket and then down into the chest. Okay, so just kind of envision that. Again, just to use it a little slightly different for some people, if you need to visualize it this way. Here is a gigantic heart, but we'll, we'll go with it here. And so this is your right atrium, and so you'll have a wire uh, kind of stuck in there. And then this dual chamber pacemaker, you'll have a wire stuck down here in the right ventricle of your heart. Uh, so I'm going to go back to our, um, our x-ray here. And so we've got a wire jade up right up here in the right atrium, and then we've got a wire down here in the right ventricle. Okay? So that's what's happened to you. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, we can cover that more in detail later. So, and you see some of the basic terminology. So what can happen after we put it in? This is not procedural complications. This is after the procedure complications. So the most common problem that we run into, obviously, is infection. Uh, we hate that. Infection does happen, though. So that's what we really try to um, avoid. So there's skin infections. That would be up here superficial. And then there can be lead infections. That's, that's infections down in the heart where those wires are. That's obviously a huge problem. Uh, I highlighted there. Going to not talk about that as much, although I'll, I'll hit a few things that you can do to try to avoid that. But the skin superficial infections are what I'm really wanting you to help us avoid. Uh, obviously, you can get bleeding. We've cut on you. There can be blood, and blood thinners can make that worse. So you can get a hematoma. That's a pocket or a pocket of blood right there. That can be painful and tender. The wound can open up. That would be a huge problem also. Typically, that occurs when either for some reason the sutures or the glue fails or if the patient's kind of moving their arm around too much, something like that, that can open up that wound. Other things that you may not be aware of right away are these ideas of lead dislodgement or perforation. So dislodgement is not that you rip the pacemaker wire all the way out of the body, but just that you pull that pacemaker wire just slightly away from its point of contact. So if we've got it nice, and I don't know if you can see that well or not, but I've got it touching the skin surface there, so I would have it touching the heart surface. That's a good connection, and it's actually screwed in typically. But if you pull that back, now you've got a gap, and that can be a real problem. Uh, it can be harder for the pacemaker to work, or maybe it doesn't work at all. Uh, it can chew through more voltage. It can wind down your battery a lot faster. Uh, again, that might not be something you're aware of. It wouldn't be until we check the pacemaker that that might or might not be apparent. Obviously, if the pacemaker fails because it's not capturing, then you would be aware of that. The other one uh, you would be probably more aware of, and that's perforation. Typically, that's not something you did wrong, but that would be where the wire moves forward. So dislodgement, the wire is usually kind of pulling back. If it were to go forward, it would punch through the skin surface, and that's obviously usually a painful experience. And if the pacemaker's pacing, you'll get a uh, stimulation that's uncomfortable. So that typically the patient's aware of. They're calling and complaining, or they're presenting to an ER. Um, I mentioned this already, uh, pacemaker stimulation. We'll go into that a little bit more, but some people actually uh, uh, can, can feel the pacemaker firing off, and that has to do with the amount of voltage. Typically, that's in our bigger pacemakers, the ones with three wires, but that is a, quote, complication. Thankfully, that one's an easy one to fix. And then the last kind of big complication that I'm going to address, blood clots. So we have stuck catheters into a vein that can impede any blood flow from the arm coming back. And so if it impedes blood flow too much, you can get a blood clot there, and you'd get swelling in the arm. It'd be discomforting. Uh, usually, it's kind of up here starting off. Um, so those are common complications that we, we, we worry about, obviously. Let's see here. This one's just a good example of what a lead dislodgement is. And let me get my camera out of the way here so you can see it better. So we've got the same uh, patient. And this person has a three-wire system, but we're primarily just focusing on the, um, uh, the, let's see if I can get it right there for you. We're primarily focusing on this wire right here. Uh, it should be up here and so this is after we've got it fixed and put it back in the right spot but in this case her atrial lead fell out of the right atrium and down into the right ventricle and that's obviously a, a, a problem and it had to be fixed the other wires are in the right spot but that's what we mean by lead dislodgement the wire falls or moves into a wrong spot uh, again it is correctable but unfortunately it requires another surgical uh, interaction okay so this is the important thing this is what i want you to hear this is what you need to take away from this how do you avoid complications? And this is what you can do to avoid the complications. The number one, the simplest answer is leave the incision alone. Just don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Uh, don't put any creams on it. Don't put any ointments on it. Don't scrub our dermabond off. Just, just leave it alone. Okay? Uh, I mean that in the nicest way possible. 
check with your provider. Everybody's going to have a slightly different answer for you on when to start showering and when to start bathing and all those kind of things. But in general, at the beginning, just don't touch the thing. Uh, get some instructions from uh, your provider's office. For us, we do say it's okay to shower the next day. We just ask our patients not to scrub the area. We ask for the water spray not to hit directly on the wound. Um, and then afterwards, we just ask you to pat it dry with a clean towel. And again, not scrubbing, just patting it dry. Okay. Also, um, for our patients, we have very clear instructions on blood thinners. Blood thinners are things like Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, uh, Plavix, Berlinta, Effiant. Those are the big common ones. Coumadin's another one. There should be clear instructions from whoever your provider is. For us, we're going to write it down on a piece of paper, and we're going to say stop it on this day and don't start it till this day. Make sure you understand that. Make sure you don't start your blood thinners too soon. If you do and their bleeding starts here, that's how you get these hematomas. Um, again, it never hurts to double check. If you're confused, for our office, you can text. Uh, for many offices, you can send a patient portal message, or if you have to, you just stop by their office and just ask, hey, I just want to understand, when do I start this blood thinner back up? That is an important thing to understand because we do want to get you back on those blood thinners. Those things are important uh, for other reasons, but from a bleeding complication standpoint, we want you to clarify when to start. And then this may seem simple, but obviously stay clean. Uh, those first few weeks is not the time to go out and start a marathon. It's not the time to climb underneath your house and wallow through the mud and fix the plumbing. Uh, not a time to have a, I don't know, a sick child that's laying on your chest uh, with their mucus production coming out and rubbing on there. Just be clean. Just be clean with your wound. Uh, it's a direct highway to the heart, and we don't want bacteria to climb in there. So it should be pretty straightforward. Other things, and again, this is going to be more specific for us. You need to check with your provider on how this works. We say don't lift your arm, um, a certain range of motion, so we'll explain that, but don't lift uh, your arm with more than 10 pounds in it. And for most people, uh, for ladies, that would be probably no more than their purse. Um, it's certainly not very much weight at all, so it might even be worth going to a place like Academy and picking up a 10-pound weight and kind of seeing where it is. But no lifting more than 10 pounds, uh, and basically we say that for the first two weeks until you see us. Uh, and then we ask our patients not to drive for that first week. There's a lot of reasons for that. One being the seatbelt's going to run right across that, and it's going to be very tender and hurt. Also, if you're driving and you need to swerve, all of a sudden there's a good chance you're going to twist and torque that arm around. So, uh, so we ask our patients not to drive at least for the first week. And in some cases, we'll even make them wait for the full two weeks uh, till we bring them back in the office and do a formal wound check. Uh, but definitely no driving the first week for us and for most uh, folks, I would imagine. Range of motion, and we'll see if you can see this. I'm going to try to make big here. So range of motion. In general, we try not to dislodge those wires, so you remember in there. So we want to keep our arm no higher than this, so we don't want to be reaching up, and that's this first couple of weeks, and we usually say about four weeks, sometimes even six weeks, depending on the case, but no reaching way up with the arm, no going way back with the arm. We try to keep it in this area right here, okay? So this is kind of your wheelhouse for those first few weeks. You don't need to be torquing back with this arm. You don't need to be reaching back. Any of those things, I can kind of feel tension coming on my chest wall. That's a bad thing. We don't need to be feeling tension in here. We don't need to be seeing how far we can stretch it. It may not hurt. You may not feel anything. Some people it hurts, and actually that's kind of good for us at the beginning. We we want it to be a little tender so you don't overuse it. But mainly just keep it in here. If you can just imagine a, a flat plane, don't go above this flat plane. Don't go above the flat plane this way. Don't go back this way. Just keep it in this box right here. And again, that's at least for the first two weeks. Often we'll say for the first month, there's just this chance of dislodgement. It's so much better to take your time, um, wait a couple of weeks, wait a couple of, uh, a month, or maybe even six weeks for some of our folks that are really um, doing high level sports or something that might really torque the arm. We actually will extend it out to six weeks, but at least that first month, just be gentle with it. We don't want to freeze it up. So I see people who go out and get a, um, um, a sling and they really just hold it tight the whole time. That's not good either. You're going to get to a frozen shoulder out of that. You're going to get arthritis. That's not what we want. So we do want you to use it. We just want you to be conservative in your use. So, so don't be frozen. Don't be scared, but also don't be crazy with it. Okay. And then again, uh, you see this down here, the last thing, uh, take your antibiotics and that's if applicable, that's going to be on a case by case basis. Uh, for us, we do occasionally have people take antibiotics after the procedure. If there's concerns for risk, or if we haven't used one of those, uh, antibiotic envelopes, um, again, I would just ask you to make sure you understand, uh, if you've been prescribed an antibiotic, typically for us, we use something called minocycline. Uh, there's other antibiotics that can be used depending on allergies and whatnot. Uh, but understand your medical regimen, understand what is new. Uh, I go back to those blood thinners. Uh, make sure you have a good, clear understanding of what's going on there. 
last couple of slides here, what are common expectations? Yes, it's going to hurt a little bit. You, you've had a knife cut a wound open in your chest, so you would expect there to be some pain there. But it only should hurt a little bit. Uh, in our experience, we have never needed high-powered pain medicines. Uh, patients just simply don't hurt that much. Ice and Tylenol are, are your friends. Um, and again, I would ask you to check with your medical provider if Tylenol is safe for you. There are some patients that that is not safe, so I wouldn't just willy-nilly have everybody go out on Tylenol. But in general, if you'll be icing it and if you'll stay ahead of the pain with uh, Tylenol on a regular basis, typically we say one uh, extra strength Tylenol, no more than about three, four at max a day. Typically we say uh, one Tylenol about every eight hours should be more than enough. Along with ice, we typically like patients to ice it. Uh, you want dry ice, don't be getting the wound all wet or anything like that. But, uh, but if you want an ice pack with a towel in between it to keep the water off of it, ice for about 10 minutes and then give yourself a good 30 minute break, maybe even an hour break, and then ice it again for 10 minutes. If you'll stay on top of that ice at the beginning and really help kind of calm that inflammation down, most of the pain goes away pretty quick. Again, we've had good results with that. You should expect some mild swelling. It's cut and you've stuck a device in your chest. So it's going to be swollen at first. It's going to be more swollen than it will be long term. So a little bit of swelling is okay. We expect that. We expect you to kind of see kind of a um, protuberance uh, sticking out, uh, but it should not be large. Bruising is another thing. And I'm going to get myself back here. So yeah, we've made a cut here and then blood will often travel down through here. And sometimes it's going to travel down into over in this area. And so if you get some bruising, uh, not bleeding, but if you get some bruising down even into here, for ladies, sometimes it can get into the breast tissue down here. That is all okay. That's not scary. That's just some people bleed a little bit more than others. It can be a little tender because of the bruising. You can even get some that will go out into the arm just a little bit. Uh, hopefully, though, it should not be black and blue all over. You shouldn't have giant, you know, bruise marks. Uh, if that, something like that happens, we'll probably have talked to you about the fact that there was some sort of abnormal bleeding. But a little bit of bruising, particularly right below the uh, pacemaker or defibrillator has put in, that's, that's common. Uh, another common thing that we run into is itching. Uh, the dermabond in particular for some patients, that glue is an irritant to their skin, and so they can itch quite a bit. Um, for some patients, again, check, but we will often recommend maybe a little Allegra or um, a little Zyrtec. Uh, again, please, please, please check with your provider, make sure that's safe for you, but that can kind of help knock down some of the itching. And again, I go back to it, ice is your friend. Ice helps the itching out as well, so just uh, stand on top of that ice more than you realize. It'll really help you out. Okay, so those were common expectations. What do you do to make yourself, you know, if you're worried or if there's a huge problem? So if you're having severe pain, if that wound is so painful, you just can't even hardly stand it, moving your arm hurts. If you're getting pain, like a, a pressure down here, if you're having trouble breathing, if you can't lie down, those are concerning signs. We should not have that happen. Uh, you should not have that happen. So that would be something that if you can get a hold of your provider quickly, yes, please do. Uh, if you can't get a hold of your provider quickly, go to the ER. That's what I would tell you. Maybe in urgent care. A lot of times the urgent care is just going to send you straight to the ER anyway. Uh, so severe pain, unable to breathe, you can't lay down, anything like that, that's a, that's a huge problem. Um, if the wound falls open, if you've kind of overused your arm and now you've torn the incision open, that's definitely something you want your provider to see that day. Try to get in touch with them very quickly. Uh, if you're having anything that sounds like uh, infection, if you're having fevers or chills, body aches, that kind of stuff, if you say, hmm, I'm getting infected, again, same thing, you got to call your provider right away. Uh, and then drainage. It's rare, but there are times where a little drainage can be okay. But in general, drainage is not a good thing. And so no matter what kind of drainage, we at our office want you to call us, uh, text us, uh, send us a message, somehow or another get in contact with us and let us know. Um, again, your provider will have certain differences. Every once in a blue moon, we get lucky and you come in, there's just a little bit of drainage, maybe a little bit of blood has oozed out and that's not a big deal and we can dress that up and take care of it. But in general, we want to know if there's drainage from the incision site. Okay, how can you help us out? So we don't like people to get their teeth cleaned or have any kind of dental procedures for two months afterwards. And the reason for that is bacteria can be ingested down there, get into the bloodstream and get down to those uh, wires. We talked about infections in the heart. That's one of our big concerns, obviously. So while that tissue is healing up in the heart, we just ask for any routine or elective, uh, any surgeries actually, but dental cleanings in particular, please just avoid that. Please have a conversation with your provider before the pacemaker or defibrillator is put in if you're planning on any kind of surgical procedure. 
We also don't like any kind of massages or chiropractor type stuff for the first two months. And mainly that's just for mashing, right? So if, if you're getting a massage and they're torquing your arm or a chiropractor, they're manipulating on your spine and mashing on this area. It's going to be tender. It's going to hurt. You're not going to like it anyway. Um, but we would prefer you not do that. We've mentioned already driving. Definitely no driving for a week, and, and we'll give you those kind of clarifications for each patient, but uh, definitely no driving for the first week. And then our usual request is we ask patients to stay off of interstates and stuff for the uh, second week. So just pop all around, maybe go down to the grocery store, but try not to go very far that second week. Uh, again, you're not going to like it. The seatbelt's going to rub on there, so you're, you're not going to want to do it anyway. And again, for us, no lifting more than 10 pounds uh, for the first two weeks. Just being super careful, okay? Okay. Uh, one last little thing I'll mention. This is not so much a complication as something we can fix. And people who get three-wire pacemakers, these are the CRTP, CRTDs. You may have heard that term. Even sometimes in people who get two-wire pacemakers, you can get something called pacemaker stimulation. And it's basically electrical voltage that is causing the chest uh, in some way or another to uh, stimulate. So either the lungs or the muscle itself. Uh, and so you're going to get you're going to get twitching down here, and you can get it at 20 beats. Of, or 60 beats a minute if we've got you stimming too much. That can be very uncomfortable. Sometimes it's positional, so if you lay on your left side, it might get worse, or you lay back, it might get worse. That's definitely not a go to the ER problem. That's a call your provider problem. And in fact, we can treat that better in our office than we can um, if you go to the ER. In our office, we can hook you up to our pacemaker programmers and adjust those settings and, and get, get rid of that uncomfortable sensation you've got. Uh, so mainly, if you're getting twitching, it's not pain. It's, it's just a, it's a twitching. It's a, it's a hiccup. It's you're just doing a crazy dance. Anything like that, that's something we would like for you to please, please, please just call us. Please don't go to the ER for that uh, and give us a shout out, okay? Uh, usually, again, we can take care of that pretty simply, pretty simply. Um, that's it for wound care. That's the basics. There's so much more we could cover, and I'm sure you've got other questions on this. Uh, anybody that's out there, please uh, present your questions down below in the comments, and uh, we'll see what we can find out, see what things I didn't cover on this one. But I think this probably gets you 85 to 90 percent of the common questions we run into, and hopefully that will take away some of your concerns, uh, some of your uh, trepidation about getting a pacemaker. So um, thanks as always. I uh, look forward to putting more videos out there to hopefully make healthcare a little less confusing for you.